understanding all the options available in the CARES Act and making sense of the best choices for you can be a huge headache. For one thing, you have to spend countless hours reading through articles and searching for explanations or nag your colleagues and hope they got the right answers. You also have to calculate the break even on employee layoffs compared to SBA loan forgiveness compared with long-term economic stability for your practice. Plus, there's the challenge of guessing at whether the interpretations of these new laws might change in a week and completely derail your strategy. As a result, managing your financial well-being and the cash flow in your practice during this uncertain period is a more time-consuming and all-encompassing hassle than you ever bargained for. Fortunately, there's a better way. Introducing Moss, Luce & Womble, a one-stop financial planning and accounting firm that specializes in the unique needs of dental professionals, so you can relax knowing you've left the complexity of analyzing all your options to the experts. With Moss, Luce & Womble, we allocate appropriate resources to provide accurate and vetted information to all our clients and their colleagues that can be trusted. Then, we speak with our clients to help them understand their individual situations and customize a plan. And when these more immediate concerns wane, we'll spend a full day learning about you and your goals. In addition to being the foundation of your step-by-step -step financial plan, this in-depth consultation will also serve as an integral part of the process every year going forward. And of course, you can also trust in our commitment to personalized service, like speaking directly with a member of our team via email or phone whenever you have questions or need advice. One of the smartest ways to ensure the health of your practice is to put sensible routines into place. Our accounting, tax, and payroll services are designed to help you keep your finances in the best shape for the long term. But perhaps the best thing of all is that our services are designed with efficiency in mind. We integrate those tax and accounting compliance services with our tailored personal and business financial planning advice. This often saves you time and money. To learn how MLW can provide vital solutions and expertise you need to achieve a sense of balance, direction, and peace of mind during these turbulent times, review our website at mlwfinancial.com or call our office to schedule an introductory meeting at 972-674-2584. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Moss, and I'd like to welcome you to the next installment in our MLW webinar series regarding the impact of COVID-19 on your practices. Now more than ever, the information we are gathering on this changing landscape around the implementation of programs created in the CARES Act seems to be adjusted daily, if not hourly. This leads to a lot of misinformation and confusion. And the decisions that you're being forced to make to sustain your business are too important to move forward with misinterpreted information. So we have spent the last week in research, contacting representatives from government agencies and banks and analyzing all angles to try and compile a concise presentation of data for you. And you'll see this evening that some of this information is still quite fluid and unknown. So we will also be your best guide uh, to try to come up with some decision tools um, and provide some explanations when you know, nothing else is available to you to make an informed decision. This evening's topics are gonna to cover how to prepare for the PPP loan application process, making sense of the PPP loan forgiveness versus unemployment benefits, the applicability of the FMLA and emergency paid sick leave mandates, and considerations involving other relevant areas of the CARES Act. Our panelists are gonna be MLW partners, Jason Luce, Michael Womble, and senior planner, Miles Kellum. If you have questions for our panelists, please use that Q&A feature located in the application. We will answer the most commonly asked questions live, and we also have a separate off-air panel that will be responding to some of your questions via that Q&A function. And as a reminder, we won't be using the chat feature. So let's kick things off with this hot button item that we've got this evening, the Payroll Protection Program Loan Application. So Michael, let's go to you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Thanks for joining us tonight uh, for another installment of us trying to keep you guys up to date on what's going on and the latest information. Uh, so as many of you have probably heard, uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program loans are supposed to drop tomorrow. Uh, and then Jeff, do you have the slide deck? There we go. Yeah, so 
technically speaking from an SBA standpoint, uh, this is all supposed to go live tomorrow morning, uh, first thing. Uh, however, we are hearing uh, mass chaos and confusion from several banks that we've talked to regarding this situation. Uh, the, apparently within the past couple of days, there has been uh, changes made between the SBA and Treasury Department uh, and banks are still awaiting guidance from, from those two institutions. Uh, there was one bank that we've been in close contact with uh, over the past couple of days uh, that was supposed to be on a conference call with the SBA today at 4.30 uh, to get clarity, issue guidance on what documents will be needed. Uh, that has gotten pushed to tomorrow, so we're not even sure if they're going to be able to, to start accepting applications tomorrow uh, yet or not. Uh, so. There appears to be a lot still up in the air uh, with, with massive changes that have happened uh, even just over the past couple of days with all institutions involved. Um, one of the questions that we've received is, you know, where do you even go to apply for one of these loans? Uh, the best options to start with are going to be uh, banks where you have your business banking relationship, uh, or if you have a practice loan, uh, potentially the practice lender, if that's somebody different, uh, in a lot of cases, those are actually the, the same institution. Uh, we're not quite sure yet what these applications are going to look like. We've received guidance from some of the larger institutions that the actual application uh, is going to be done through their online portal. Uh, so it, it, it may be a scenario where you're logging into uh, your online banking portal and able to apply uh, electronically that way. Uh, some of the smaller banks will probably still be the paper application. Uh, if uh, that's the way that they are going to collect these documents. Uh, so again, reach out to your business banking uh, contact or, or relationship manager to see uh, the most efficient way to process uh, these applications or your practice lender. Uh, most banks, uh, almost all banks we've spoken with have been very protective of these loans. Uh, they've communicated that they're going to serve their existing clientele first before expanding this to non-clients. A lot of even implemented uh, requirements where you had to have had a, a checking account with them as of you know, mid-February before uh, they would even consider accepting your application as well. Uh, while there's a lot in the air as far as what's going on with these, these applications and what supporting documentations will be needed, the one thing that has been communicated to us uh, is that this is the application. Uh, this was rolled out uh, towards the, the beginning of this week in draft format. Uh, that draft language was taken off. Uh, so it's our understanding from the multiple banks that we've spoken with uh, that this is the application and that won't change. Now, with everything up in the air, that very well may be subject to change also, but it's our understanding that this will remain constant. Um, so we thought it would be beneficial to go through this with you guys and communicate what this looks like, how to complete this, uh, so that you're educated on how to go through and complete this application process. Uh, so the first section or the top section uh, at the top of the application, uh, the nonprofit, uh, veteran organization, uh, tribal, independent contractor, or self-employed, these are all exceptions to uh, the typical SBA process. Um, so these are exceptions that will be rolled out later. Uh, for any of you that are set up as a professional limited liability company, uh, professional corporation, S corporation, uh, for most of you that are practicing uh, inside a separate business entity uh, that's taxed as an S-Corp partnership, uh, an entity that has limited li liability protection, it's our understanding that you would not select any of those fields uh, since that would not apply to you. Now, I, I will caveat this and say while we have reviewed this application, there's very little instruction and guidance that goes along with this application. Um, again, we've reached out to multiple banks and uh, there's, there's a lack of guidance on how some of these fields uh, should be input. Uh, we have gotten some clarity, so we're trying to give uh, everybody the best knowledge that we have uh, to get started on this process. Uh, so the, the other things in this top section, business legal name, uh, that's going to be the, the legal name with the IRS and state that you're practicing in, uh, trade name, business primary address, uh, taxpayer ID number, uh, contact information, phone number, and email address. Uh, the, the most challenging section uh, in this first part of the application is, is going to be the calculation of the average monthly payroll 
Now, I, I will note for uh, all MLW clients, we are calculating this for you and we will get this information to you in your secure portal. So this is not something that you will need to calculate on your own. However, we will need you to input this on the, the application. Uh, so kind of this, this middle column here, the average monthly payroll, uh, you know, two and a half times that is going to be your loan amount. Um, so that Jeff, the next slide uh, is going to have uh, the detail on uh, our best understanding of how that calculation uh, should be done. So on the calculation of average, average monthly payroll, um, on the instructions for this application, one of the, the hotly debated uh, questions was what time period does this involve? And, and initially, uh, there was discussion on, on whether the time period was going to be a combination of 2019 and 2020. Uh, per the instructions for most taxpayers, this is going to be their average monthly payroll uh, for 2019. So for anyone that was in business from February 15th uh, of 2019 to June 30th, uh, this is going to be your average monthly payroll for calendar year 2019. There is an alternative uh, payroll schedule for anybody that wasn't in business for that time period. It's actually going to be a, an alternate calculation where it's going to be uh, the average monthly payroll of, of January and February of this year. But for, for anybody that doesn't fit into that exception box that was open for all of 2019, it's going to be your 2019 numbers. Um, so to start off, we have all wages under 100, any employee that made under $100,000 last year, we've aggregated those numbers together to come up with gross wages under $100,000 combined. So this would be all of your uh, employees under that $100,000 limit, um, which for most of you is probably going to be, you know, almost all employees unless you have an associate doctor in the practice that's paid as a W-2 employee. Uh, any highly comp individuals, anybody earning more than $100,000, uh, any gross wages over $100,000 are capped at $100,000 per employee. Uh, so that second line item is going to be the $100,000 cap for any highly compensated employee. Uh, group health insurance premiums. Uh, so any group health insurance premiums paid by the employer, that's included in this uh, average monthly payroll. So th the payroll description is a bit of a misnomer because it does take into consideration payroll, but it also takes in into consideration uh, other items as well. Uh, so group health insurance is in there. Retirement benefit contributions. So these are going to be the employer contributions for the 401k plan, uh, cash balance plan, defined benefit plan, uh, if any of you have those plans paid by the employer. So this is going to be the employer contribution into those plans, uh, not any salary deferrals that are deducted from uh, employees' paychecks. Uh, and then the last thing is going to be state and local payroll taxes paid by the employer. Uh, so that's gonna be any state unemployment uh, or local payroll taxes. Uh, there was, we've, we've seen some guidance from some institutions that that includes uh, Social Security and Medicare, that is not correct. It's just going to be the state and local payroll taxes that are in that calculation. Uh, so all of those things are added up. So all gross wages uh, under 100,000 per employee, highly comped is capped at 100,000, group health insurance premiums paid up by the employer, uh, employer contributions and retirement plans, state and local payroll taxes. So the sum of this figure is 336,640 divided by 12. So our average monthly payroll for the application in this scenario is just a little over $28,000. Uh, so that's what's going to go in that first box on the application. So 28,000 goes there, uh, and then two and a half times that equals your loan amount. Uh, now the next item there, as far as number of jobs, uh, we've tried to get guidance and clarification on, on what that number is, and, and we have not been able to get guidance on uh, where that number should come from. Uh, for all of our clients, for now, we're pulling number of jobs on their uh, fourth quarter 941, just to have something to reconcile back to as a starting point for now. Um, if there's further guidance, that may change, but that's our best guesstimate at this time, and we've not been able to get any other information on what that should, uh, that should include. So the next section down uh, is where you're going to select uh, the purpose of the loan. So you'll check the box, uh, payroll, uh, rent and mortgage interest or utilities. Those are the, the categories that, that you've heard uh, most commonly as far as uh, what this loan is for. Um, and then the, the next uh, section down below that, the applicant ownership. 
So this needs to be completed for all owners uh, with greater than a 20% ownership stake. Uh, so for if you're applying on behalf of your entity, so let's say you have a PLLC taxed as an S corporation. Uh, so the entity that you run your practice through is going to be the borrower. Uh, if you own that entity individually, which most do, this is where you would put your, your name, title, ownership percentage, and then most likely your social. Uh, now I will say for any partnerships that are applying, um, any partnerships where the partnership is the borrowing entity, uh, the owners, if your partnership is owned by uh, subsidiary shell corporations, uh, that's where the, the shell corporation information would go here uh, on the owner name since that's technically the owner of the entity. Uh, and then along those lines as well, we've reached out to multiple banks and ask about that fact pattern for any partnerships with multiple entities. Uh, what does the application process look like? And if there's one partnership with three uh, shell corporations where there's payroll run through those corporations for potentially the doctors, you know, do we do one application or four if, if there's three partners? And they've indicated that they're expecting to see four coming from, from those. I said there would be a partnership application and then a, an application for each of the shell corps as well. Um, and, and make sure that the taxpayer ID number for those shell corps would go uh, under this section versus uh, socials. All right, next slide, please. Uh, so there's several questions that you have to go through uh, on this first page and uh, answer. Uh, so one and two, uh, hopefully those are, are pretty easy to check, uh, no on both of those. Uh, three, is the business or any owner and owner of another business or have common management with any other business? I think where this could potentially trip people up, uh, I know there are some entities uh, that own 100% of a disregarded entity. Uh, we've, we've been given guidance that, you know, in that scenario, uh, this box would have to be checked yes and attach a, an addendum explaining that ownership structure. Uh, or if there are multiple partners owned by uh, the same partners, then that box would be checked yes as well uh, to indicate uh, that structure as well, that there will be applications with different partnerships that have essentially the same owners uh, that may need to be checked there as well. Uh, and the last question here, has the business received uh, an SBA economic injury disaster loan between this time period? Uh, yes or no? Based on the backlog of, of those applications and uh, that whole process, um, I, I doubt that there are many of those loans that have actually been funded uh, by April the 3rd. Uh, if that has been done, then that will, be needed, uh, that will need to be noted on that addendum as well. And then again, uh, the last questions, um, you know, hopefully uh, five and six are, are no's as far as being able to answer no for those. And then seven, um, you have to answer seven. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the answer to seven cannot be no. If, if the answer to seven is no, then they're automatically going to kick out this application and, and will not push that through. I did ask the question uh, for any partnership entities that are owned by subsidiary entities, you know, how is, how is seven checked on, you know, I am a U.S. citizen. Uh, and the guidance I was given was applicants should go ahead and check that as, as yes, that they ultimately look to the beneficial ownership. So if there's a partnership owned by a shell corp that's owned by an individual, go ahead and check yes uh, on that because that's ultimately what the bank looks to. There's a self-certification process on page two of the application uh, where the applicant has to go through and certify that certain things will happen uh, with these loan funds. Uh, so the first and, and most important is, is where you're certifying that economic uncertainty uh, makes this loan uh, request necessary to support the ongoing op operations of the business. Uh, the second thing, just again, we're going to use these funds to maintain payroll, make lease payments and utility payments. Um, the third thing um, is, is important to note, uh, we do think that there's going to be some self-certification uh, process that happens over time. So whatever bank owns this loan, whatever bank you acquire these funds from, uh, we do think that uh, there's going to be documentation uh, that you have to submit to them um, where you're having to, to let them know what employees uh, you still have and, and certainly what the expenses are being used for as well. 
that get into the calculation figure. Um, so make sure that you're keeping up with detailed records. Again, for any of our clients working with us, that will be on the financial statements and, and we can help you with that, but you will need to, to self-report uh, these uh, figures to the banks. Uh, we're not sure what the timeline on that looks like, if that's gonna be a monthly basis or what, uh, but that will need to get reported back to the banks as well. All right, next slide. I'm oh, sorry, last thing on this slide, uh, making sure that you're certifying that you're not applying for another loan under this program. I can't imagine what fact pattern uh, that would have if you've applied for a loan under this program and received funds, uh, just certifying that you're not uh, applying for those funds again. Okay, this is, uh, we've kind of been around and around with banks over the past week and two weeks and, and had heightened conversations over the past couple of days. And while we've gotten some guidance that um, the application is, is good to go and it's what applicants will need to complete, uh, this has been the hot button where apparently what supporting documentation needs to be submitted with the application is what is changing as we speak. Uh, I received an email from a banker um, probably about three o'clock today that indicated that there's been back and forth and uh, what is going to be needed to be submitted with these applications uh, is going to be a lot more information than what was initially discussed. We have no idea. Um, we've even heard from a lot of different banks on what documentation they will need and that is all varied widely. I think that a lot of them are, are making their best guesses as well on what information you will need to go with this application. Uh, we've tried to break down what we think is a good starting point uh, to have kind of in your back pocket to go ahead and have pulled ahead of time. Um, so, you know, one of the things that's, that's noted is detailed monthly and annual payroll data uh, and reports for all of 2019. So from a starting point, uh, I think that would be 2019 941s all quarters, 2019 940, uh, 2019 W2s, any state unemployment filings, uh, payroll details by employee. So a cumulative register of, of 2019 payroll, uh, listing all pay types by employee so that they can reconcile back to that. Uh, list of employees paid greater than $100,000. Uh, 2019 practice tax return if filed, uh, practice financial statements, uh, and then if the 19 tax return hasn't been filed, uh, your 2018 tax return. Uh, we're, we're trying to make this as easy as possible for banks to be able to reconcile your application to the supporting documentation because they, they likely are not going to just submit uh, and push through whatever you put on the application. Um, as a note, uh, for, all, for all MLW clients, we are working uh, through the night to, to get all of this information uploaded to your portals uh, so that, that you at least have the, the best starting point uh, that, that we know of at this point. Uh, this is kind of the common information that we've seen from a payroll record standpoint. Uh, so you will have all of that info in your portal uh, to take and run with in the event that banks uh, are accepting applications tomorrow. And then the last thing on this slide, some of the common information that, that uh, you will, you've needed in the past if, if you've ever borrowed funds, whether it's the, the IRS, uh, EIN letter, entity documents, driver's license, that's something that's probably going to vary uh, bank by bank. Uh, and if you have an existing relationship with the bank, they may have a lot of this stuff on file uh, anyways. All right, thanks, Michael. Uh, we do have some questions that are coming in that if you could help us address some of those. Um, okay. I do wanna make a, a quick reminder out there, folks, for those of you using the chat feature, we're really trying to only keep up with the Q&A, otherwise there's a lot going on. So if you would put your questions into the, uh, the Q&A box, as opposed to using that chat feature, uh, that'll help us keep things organized. It also looks like a lot of you have some pretty uh, specific questions that are coming in about your situations. Um, to the extent that we can answer those, um, in a general way um, without knowing if it's a client or not. Um, it makes it a little difficult for us to sometimes uh, provide some of those recommendations. Um, so we're trying to give general information as much as possible, but to the extent that they're pretty specific, uh, you'll probably be getting an answer through that Q&A as opposed to it being live, just because we're trying to keep the most commonly asked questions that would pertain to everybody um, as part of this. 
Uh, so let's go to a few of those questions, Michael. Um, uh, let's start with um, in, when you're doing the calculations for the average monthly payroll um, and you're looking at the gross wages for those employees, are you supposed to include any independent contractors you pay as part of that? It's our understanding that that is not the case, that they're eligible for their own uh, paycheck protection loan. Uh, and so it's our understanding that uh, those are excluded from that calculation. Okay. And I think, you know, part of the, part of the thinking behind that is in theory, um, in roughly a week's time, independent contractors will be able to go in and submit their own application for a PPP loan um, that in theory would help their own private business uh, to be able to continue. Um, I think that was the thinking behind why those were removed from any loan available. Uh, we'll see if there's any, any money left uh, by the time that comes around, but that's a little bit more for the discussion uh, with Jason coming up. So Michael, some additional questions uh, coming in now. Um, some of these are pretty specific to the application, as I mentioned. Um, in the box, it says number of jobs. I think you might have referenced where you're pulling that from. Is that supposed to be the number of full-time equivalents or what do you recommend putting in for that number? We honestly don't have clarity on that. With that, so there's honestly not clarity on what's supposed to go into that box at this point. All right, I'm not sure. We, um, if we're trying to go with with full time, you know, with number of employees at the end of the year. In, in the look back period from 19 to 20, uh, you know, having that as a starting point, but there's, there's just not clarity on that right now. And, and we've asked multiple lenders. Okay. I think we had a little bit of a time, a little struggle hearing you on your audio there, Mike, uh, Mike, Michael, but I, I do think that um, the main point of what you were trying to say is there's not a clear answer. Um, we're going to be using pretty much, you know, something off that ties back to a supporting document uh, like the 941 from the fourth quarter or the, as you said, the, the number of employees at the end of the year. Um, yeah. Ideally, we'll get some additional guidance on that uh, that's coming up. Um, you mentioned in some of your discussion uh, talking about disregarded entities. We're getting some questions about what a disregarded entity is. Can you uh, describe that a little more? Uh, yeah, so I was mainly referring back to uh, the, the partnership structure where there may be a partnership owned by subsidiary shell corporations. So I know with a lot of partnerships, the, the partnership will be the entity that the, the revenue and expenses are run through and all the, the staff members are paid out of. Uh, so in the scenario where that entity is the borrower, uh, the subsidiary entities or, or owner uh, PLLCs, if they're PLLCs, uh, will need to be listed as, as the owning entities uh, in this scenario with the taxpayer ID for, for uh, those entities. So that was the first thing I addressed. Um, so I don't know if that answers part of the question. The, the other thing I mentioned was if, if there, are, and, and this is getting into a lot of minutia, and I apologize if it's more detailed than this webinar, but um, I know there are some partnerships out there that are, that are owned by uh, the same entities where you may have three partnerships owned by three entities. Um, we were told by the bank uh, by a couple of banks that uh, they will need to note that on the application uh, as far as is the affiliate structure on that. If, if there's common ownership uh, amongst multiple entities that are applying for these loans. No, or I'm sorry, Jeff, I, I understand what that question is coming from now. So I, I know with, with some practices, um, there will be, there may be an S corporation, a PLLC taxed as an S corporation, that owns another PLLC where the income from that entity just flows through uh, to the S corporation, uh, that would need to be noted as an affiliate schedule as well. I mean, basically if, if you've got multiple entities, uh, you know, check with your advisor uh, to see exactly how that should be filled out and documented. Uh, if you've got multiple locations or, or multiple practices. Okay, and, and along the lines of the partnerships and shells discussion, you briefly talked about one of those uh, uh, certifications that you needed to check off. And um, one of those was referencing, you know, as uh, any other business. So, you know, the applicant has not applied for another loan under this program. Correct. Um, if you are, you know, an owner of a shell entity that owns a partnership, do you still check no to that or, or what does that look like? Yes, that's our understanding. 
because there's there's payroll run out of each entity. Uh, so I think that's a, a certification of uh, the, I think that's a certification of the borrower. Um, so again, there's there's not a ton of guidance or instructions on this process yet, uh, but, but we have reached out to numerous banks and asked the question, um, you know, if, if there are multiple entities where there's payroll or cost that can be uh, used with this program, uh, are there supposed to be multiple applications? And, and that's the guidance that we've been given. Okay. And then last question, Michael, still kind of on the topic of other business. Um, does the LLC that owns my building or other real estate holdings count as any other business uh, referencing question three? Yeah, and I do not know the answer to that question. Um, we were mainly inquiring with entities that are borrowers uh, for this program. Um, I would presume that they could uh, list it, uh, but I, I don't think it should affect this application, but that's not a question that, um, you know, we ask any of the bankers specifically on that. Okay. Well, we're getting a lot of questions coming through right now that honestly are uh, pertaining to the next topic. Uh, which is going to be one I think uh, that's going to be pretty helpful in trying to at least get some insight as to what's going on behind the scenes with the PPP loan process and the strategy behind it. So I'm going to go over to Jason now with making sense of the loan forgiveness uh, versus the unemployment benefits uh, discussion. Jason. Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? Um, I'm glad I get to go after the loan application talk. That's a little bit of a sl slow burn there. So um, hopefully, hopefully this is a little more interesting. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, first, just to clarify, this really doesn't have to do any, well, it does have to do with the PPP loan, but um, I keep, we've, we've discussed several times that the $10,000 uh, grant is not free money. And so I wanted to show the mathematics of that, uh, just to kind of put this to rest, uh, because we, we've given that direction out many times and people seem to still feel like they're missing out on this money. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to go over that real quick. Uh, let's start on the right side of taking the loan. So let's say we take the economic injury disaster loan grant. So if, if we're building up a loan here, uh, our beginning balance is zero. We take our grant. That money's forgiven because it's a grant. It is free money at that point. Um, so I, I totally agree with that and I don't, uh, I don't dispute that at all. So if you go over to the free money calculation on the left, I've added $10,000 there. So right now, at this point, we're taking the grant, we get $10,000, grants are free, we don't owe the SBA any money, okay? But let's take it a step further. Let's say we then go out and get the PPP loan, just like Michael was talking about, and we borrow $100,000 on the PPP loan. Pursuant to the bill, it says that any amount forgiven on the PPP loan will be reduced by the amount of EIDL grant you take. So if I take $10,000 in PPP loan, and, and theoretically, if that's all I had taken, I, would, I, I could potentially get that 100% forgiven, but because I took the grant, I have to reduce that forgivable amount by $10,000. Thus, I can only get $90,000 forgiven. So let's look at the loan on that. Now that we've added the PPP loan of $100,000, we reduce our forgivable amount by $10,000. So we only get a $90,000 forgiveness. So at the end of this whole deal, we're left with a $10,000 loan. Okay, so let's go over to the free money. Uh, calculation. We put 10,000 in our pocket with the grant. We put 100,000 in our pocket with the PPP loan. So now we've got 110 total. We still owe the SBA 10 grand. So we only got a free money of $100,000. So like, I, like I've said, and, and we have been uh, stood behind this idea the whole time. And I, I feel like the uh, ADA and some other institutions uh, threw out some bad information on there, got everybody in a tizzy. Um, at the end of the day, you only get a hundred for, you know, in this example, a hundred thousand dollars for free, even though you took the grant. And so I, I think there was a lot of confusion on that. And I just wanted to show it mathematically on how that played out. 
Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about now that now that we've kind of cleared that up, I'm going to start moving into the PPP loan. Uh, but wanted to kind of put some perspective on on where we're at in this situation, okay? Um, because I feel like everybody's ready to rush to the banks tomorrow, which I understand. Uh, but at this point, the banks, I haven't talked to a single bank that has a clue on what they're going to do as recently as two hours ago. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to give you a couple of quotes over the, over the weeks that we've heard from banks on 316. We're on a conference call. The bank is definitely going to roll out something soon. Nothing yet. 319, no new LOCs or working capital loans at this time, if not already started. Reach out to SBA instead. Not one of my clients has had any response on the disaster loan. 31720, Three, I'm going to go talk to the sales manager and see what our, sales manager and see what our options are. On 322, putting some options together for clients by the end of the week or early next week. Nothing final yet. 316, I think we have a lot of emergency. I think we're, we'll have some emergency programs for this. Not sure how to apply it yet. Should have some guidelines soon. Okay, so the, the important thing to understand, we're all type A driver people. Everybody on this webcast is probably a type A personality. Um, and that usually doesn't, one of our personality traits is not patience. Um, and so, this is going to drive you insane if you think that it's ready to go. Um, and, and it's driving us, us crazy. As CPAs and dentists, we don't just fly off the cusp. We like to work in a, in a uh, orderly fashion and get things done that are too fast and we wanna make sure it's right. Um, and unfortunately, uh, these regulations are, are coming at us so fast and furious, uh, but there's no infrastructure set up. It, it, it'd be like um, um, having a football game and inviting 100,000 100, people uh, to a small town that had no street infrastructure. And so we're going to have to work through that process. Um, we've heard a lot. We get a lot of feedback from clients on what they're hearing on other uh, webcasts, from other groups, from this banker, that banker, colleagues. Um, and so we, we wanted to kind of tell you, it, we thought it would be best to interview as many people as we possibly could to get some idea of what's going on. Uh, so one of the areas of confusion on this PPP loan is what time frame are we going to use to calculate the average payroll? So we reached out to, and there's way more banks than this, but we just put 10 on here because I think you get the point. Uh, don't know, 2019, 2019, 2019 two years worth, don't know, 12 months rolling plus 2019, 2019, 2019, 12 months rolling. So you can see there we're getting a lot of different answers from these banks. If you'll go to the next slide, Jason. Um, this is the big critical issue. Um, how fast will this money be gone? Do you need to show up tomorrow morning and uh, get in, in, in the front of the line to get this loan? Uh, these are the responses we got. Don't know. By Friday afternoon, the money will be gone. Leadership said they don't foresee running out before June, within 24 hours, by Monday, by Sunday. Uh, we were actually able to make uh, contact with the U.S. Congressman um, and specifically asked him what would he do. He was a former small business owner. And he said, take the money, don't bank on more stimulus, it's way too much of a hot topic politically to go after more stimulus. Um, so those, that's, that's kind of the summary of the, uh, the, the survey that we did. How long will it take to get the origination? Don't know, two to three days, 10 days, expect, expect slow turnaround, processing no sooner than four, eight. And we have a, a connection with the treasury department. They say it could take weeks to finalize the loan. So just to kind of wanted to put some perspective on um, the process and where it's at. I actually just got an email from Chase Bank that said most likely they will not be able to accept applications tomorrow. I literally got that uh, two minutes ago while Michael was talking. And so I uh, just want to warn you about this process and, and how it might look when we, when we all rush to the bank to get this loan. Aside from that, I want to get I want to get down to some of the details of the loan and some of the clarification, get away from some of the bigger picture we talked about last time. 
These are the really important issues you need to focus on. This eight week time frame. You're gonna go apply for the loan. That loan will have an origination date. Like I said, I don't know when that's gonna be. Nobody knows when that's gonna be. Uh, everybody's confused on that. But let's say you apply, you get the loan, it's gonna originate at some point. From the date that loan originates, you start an eight week time frame. okay? That is your eight week time frame that you have to spend that money on authorized expenses. So in order to maximize the forgiveness on the back end of this loan, you need to spend that money during that eight week time frame. Let's revisit what those authorized costs are, salaries and wages. The problem we're gonna see with this one is that if you apply today, theoretically, let's say they rushed out and on Monday you had the loan and it originated. How are you gonna, does it make sense to pull people off unemployment when they're making more money on unemployment? I don't think so. So the problem is, is we're gonna start this eight week period before we're, start, before we're really ready to spend that money, okay? Uh, the other thing we can use this money for is retirement benefits, group health insurance, uh, utilities, and interest on debts that were incurred prior to 2015. So I, I really want you to hang on to this eight week time frame and how important that is. Another important feature of this loan that you really need to understand is the forgiveness equations. And we've talked about it in the past. Uh, Miles talked about it last webinar. Once we take this loan, it originates. We have our eight week period of time. At some point, we're gonna have to go apply for forgiveness. Okay, so we'll go to the bank. Hey, I took out a $100,000 loan. I need to prove these costs out and I've got to prove and I got to try and get forgiveness on this loan. Okay. One of the equations on that is your full time equivalent employees must be equal to must be equal when comparing it to prior periods. So that's hurdle number one. You've got to be in a similar position with full time employees. They don't define that. So if I'm looking at a client, I'm just basic, I can tell the range of hours that full-time people work, that, that for you would probably be full-time equivalent. So we gotta make sure we put ourselves in a place to meet that equation in order to get full forgiveness. The second test is we must not decrease any one salary by more than 25%. So luckily they give us a 25% threshold there. So we've got to put ourselves in a position to spend this money You've got to get it, use it, and then try and get it forgiven. One note to the forgiveness equations. If you're able to hire all your staff back by 630, they will disregard the reduction in employees and salaries from the time period of 215 to 427. So we have a little bit of a grace period there. We're sitting here today on, on 42. So for, for now, we have a grace period until 427 where they're not going to discount us or punish us for not having a full salary. So two things I want you to keep in mind, that eight week period, the forgiveness equations, and then if all, if everybody's rehired by 630, we can ignore anything from now until April 27th. So let's look at it on a timeline. So if we're looking at this timeline, we've got the date of the loan origination. Like I said, that's going to be fluid based on when you apply and when you get the money. And we go all the way to June 30th, which is the total covered period under the loan section of the bill. Okay. As you can see here, we've got that um, grace period that runs from the date of the origination and ends 30 days after enactment, which will be that 426. So anything, we are under no rush, even if we get the loan on Monday, we are under no rush to go out and rehire everybody on Monday because we have that grace period, okay? The strategy though, how do, how do I strategize? Because when I'm dealing with these decisions, my goal ultimately is to get all the money I can get and get it all forgiven because then it's free. The problem is the further away from that reopen date. So if you're going to, when, when you reopen your practice, let's just call it June 1, whatever, for as an example, the further you are away from that reopen date, in other words, where you're going to rehire everybody and bulk up those, those staff equation numbers, the further you are away from that, the less forgiveness you're ultimately going to get. Um, so as we move that 
eight week period down the timeline, our level of forgiveness goes up because it's more likely that we would have rehired everybody, thus putting us in a better position to meet the payroll equations that we need to get forgiveness. So that's, that's where we're in a quandary because we know that we need the money, but the sooner we take it, the less likely we will be able to be to get it fully forgiven. And so you can see that here as we near that rehire date, reopen date, our level of forgiveness goes up. So that puts us in a predicament right now. And a lot of this predicament honestly was created because of the high unemployment that employees are getting home. Like it just, there is no incentive to take someone off that unemployment right now. Well, if you've got to meet your payroll equations to, and take people off unemployment, then, then you're kind of in a catch 22 on that. So this leaves us down to the decision of, do we apply now or do we wait? And to me, it's a personal decision. And it kind of depends on what you're, what you're wanting to accomplish. If, you, if your goal is that you want to get money right now or as fast as possible, you need to apply right now. If your sole goal is getting the money, you need to apply as soon as possible. If, if your sole goal is I want to maximize forgiveness, then you need to wait until you need the money. Okay? If I'm going to apply now, I want to get the money now. I'm going to apply tomorrow or as soon as it becomes available. We know that the downside to that is less forgiveness because it's harder to maximize full-time equivalent and salary reduction thresholds. What's the worst case scenario if we apply now and we don't get full forgiveness, you end up with a loan at 0.5% amortized over two years. And we talked in prior webinars that the bill said it was up to 10 years and they finalized that on too, which isn't as good as, you know, that's nowhere near the 10 years they said in the bill, but it's also nowhere the 4% interest rate they were claiming in the bill. So um, worst case scenario, we get the money, we don't get it all forgiven, we end up with a two year loan at 0.5%, okay? The alternative is to wait. Who would wait? Well, anybody that's primary goal is to maximize the forgiveness of the money. You're not so much worried about getting the money, you wanna make sure you get free money. If that's the case, you need to wait until you need the money to take that loan. The downside to that strategy is the programs could run out of money uh, before you have a chance to get in line, okay? What's the worst case scenario of that? You left some free money on the table. And so for me, I don't like being, I, I think it's best to everybody to analyze their situation independently and say, hey, do you need the money now? Is, or is it okay to wait and potentially lose it? I mean, you could talk to a hundred different people and you'll get a hundred different opinions on whether that money is going to be around or not. Now, based on our conversation with the congressman or via the congressman, he said the likelihood of more stimulus. So if they run out and it's like, oh, don't worry if they run out, they're gonna have more stimulus. He said the likelihood of that is very low. And if it did happen, it would take months to work through that process, okay? So apply now or wait. That's a decision you're gonna to have to make depending on your situation. If you're gonna apply now, what does that strategy look like under that, under that decision? One point I want to make is we still need clarification from the SBA and the Treasury. I know everybody's saying that, but it's the truth. The SB, just to put some perspective on it, the SBA's application contradicts the bill. That's how messed up this whole scenario is. But we've studied the bill in depth and think we have a pretty good understanding on it. But more clarification is obviously going to help us with this strategy. So we're going to apply now. So what do we do? Tomorrow, as soon as uh, you can get your applications in and work with your bank, get in line and get try and get that approval once it originates so now we've got the origination of the loan well let me make one point the ideal scenario on a apply now strategy uh, situation would be that you go you apply you're approved by the bank and there's delays in the process just due to bureaucracy and it just pushes that time out and again the further we go down that time the better off we are from a forgiveness standpoint. That'd be ideal. You get in line first, you get the approval, you're in line with the bank and there's just delays there. So we go, we put our application in, 
it originates. On the date of origination, it probably makes sense to pull the doctor off unemployment and put them back on payroll at the equivalent of $100,000 per year, okay? Because you're gonna make more money getting that $100,000 than you would be on, on unemployment. Not a ton, it's probably to the tune of $800 a week, um, but that's one, that's one thing that we would probably recommend as soon as you, as soon as you get that, go ahead and pull that uh, doctor off unemployment and put them back on payroll. At the same time, I would consider pulling a non-doctor spouse off unemployment and putting him or her at a higher rate due to increase in responsibilities. If we have this loan, I have a lot of doctors that uh, their spouse has had to take a bigger role now uh, because staff's on unemployment. That could justify a higher salary and thus more utilization of the funds that go back into our pocket. Okay. At the time it originates, we'd start paying rent, retirement benefits, utilities, and debt and we would keep everybody on unemployment for the time being. Why? Because we have that grace period. We have that grace period till 427. So once we hit 427, our grace period ends. So what do we do at that point? At that point, I'd consider pulling higher paid employees off on enrollment, unemployment and putting them on payroll. So you might have a hygienist that's taken a cut and pay on, um, unemployment or an associate doctor, whatever the case is, that's taking a hit on unemployment. This might be a good time to bring them back because they're actually gaining, unlike other, other lower paid employees that are winning on unemployment, these people would want to come back on payroll. I might look to bring those people back on to start boosting up those full-time equivalency numbers and um, salary uh, reduction numbers. And so, um, that's, that would be a point to consider doing that to try and get those formulas in better condition. Now, if you did that, it's obviously you could waste some money of your loan by paying people that could otherwise get unemployment. So you have to weigh those considerations. Um, at that time, you could consider pulling all employees off unemployment and putting them on payroll. Uh, that'll further help you increase your payroll equation. The problem is they're being well taken care of on the unemployment system. And so why would you pull them off unemployment and waste your loan dollars just so you could get forgiveness? Really, it's dollar in, dollar out. And so I don't know that it makes sense at that time to pull everybody back just to get your payroll equations up. And so that's why at that point, we have to kind of assess and see what we want to do. The third part of that strategy is you have to make sure everybody's rehired at full salary by 620 six thirty twenty. Um, in order to get the grace period from now until four twenty seven, everybody has to be rehired by six thirty. And so that's an important part of this strategy to make sure we meet those uh, equations. Another question that we have gotten a lot is, hey Jason, I am uh, I have a practice and we are uh, we're gonna see emergencies and I'm concerned, I, I'm concerned that if I pay my employees, they're gonna get re a reduction of benefits on, on the unemployment system. And that's true. And so I think the goal is, the goal is not to preserve the state unemployment just for the, state, just for the sake of state unemployment. The goal is that we preserve that $600 a week of Fed money, okay? So let's remember, in order to get the $600 a week of Fed money, which probably nobody's gotten now, so I, I get that, but it's supposed to be retroactive and they're working with the states to get that done. But remember, the goal is to preserve that $600 uh, money coming from the feds. Well, in order to do that, your employee has to be eligible for state unemployment. So you can't run your employee afoul of that state unemployment, run them down to zero, because they're not gonna get the $600 and we need that $600 in the state unemployment to take the burden off of us, right? And so we're in, a, we're in a weird situation because we need the employees to get that money, but yet we need some of them to work some time. And so that puts us in a, in a situation of trying to figure out how, much, how many hours can I employ someone without running to the zero on the unemployment, okay? That's a tricky, that, that can be a little bit tricky and it varies state by state. Uh, one thing that we wanted to pull up here is a website uh, that you can go to and it, it's actually linked from the, the uh, USA Department of Labor. You can go onto this website and search your state and find 
all the specific information about your unemployment. Okay, so we want to go on there. We want to figure out what is the range that somebody could work or earn without running their state unemployment to zero. So Jason, can you go to the next slide on that? I want to walk through a hypothetical uh, scenario. So let's say we have Susie. Susie, 18 bucks an hour. She averaged 32 a week. Her average weekly pay is $700 or $576 if she's working full time. Okay. Her unemployment benefit uh, is probably going to approximate about $299 a week. Okay. So she's going to get the $299 plus the $600 from the Fed. So she's going to get approximately $899 a week on on unemployment when she's used to making 576, okay? So Susie is our main assistant and we need to bring her into work, but we do not want to run that state benefit down to zero, okay? Every state has a little different equation, but most run something like this. That employee, Susie, she's earning $299.52 on state unemployment she can earn up to 25% of her weekly benefit or $74.88 without any reduction in state unemployment. So in the state of Texas, you can, you can work up, you know, you can earn up to 25% of that, that weekly benefit and you take zero reduction in unemployment. Well, we win on that because we get our unemployment, we get our 600, we're good. So if you take that, if you take the max earnings she could have without reducing her um, unemployment, divided by her hourly rate of 18, essentially Susie could work 14.16 hours per week, get paid by you, get her 299.52 from the state and get her $600 from the feds. That's the bottom threshold. Now what's the maximum Susie could work without running uh, state unemployment down to zero? So let's go down to the bottom. Her max benefits $299.52. Her earning threshold is 125% of her earnings. So she could earn up to $374.40 and still be eligible for unemployment. Now it would reduce, her, her unemployment's gonna start reducing above 25% weekly benefit and it will completely zero out at 125. I know this is a lot, of, a lot of math, but I'm trying to give some perspective on how this should be figured out. So on, under this scenario, Susie could work anywhere from 14, 14.16 hours to 20.8 hours and still keep her unemployment and still get the Fed uh, $600. So that's kind of a range for Susie. Now that's dependent on what you have to look at is that particular employee's monthly benefit. I've told my clients, just tell them to screenshot you and let you know what that is. Um, and then you've got to kind of back into how many hours they could work without earning too much money to put them in that situation, okay? I know like, for example, not all states are like this, but Georgia, for example, their threshold is any earnings you earn above $50 will dollar for dollar reduce your weekly benefit. And so if you earned $100 in Georgia in a week, that would reduce your monthly benefit by $50. So any amount earned over $50 will reduce your benefit dollar for dollar. But most states are gonna have some sort of formula that's within a range like this um, and we just got to figure out what those are per state. You can use that website to figure that out. And I guess that's the end of my presentation, Jeff. All right. Great, Jason. We do have a lot of questions that are coming in. Um, before, Jason, I go to you with those questions, I did just want to uh, bring one update that we just recently, uh, recently received. Um, I know earlier Michael in his presentation referenced um, the, uh, the loan, the PPP loan actually uh, you know, going um, for the next two years, being offered at a half percent. Uh, Jason, you mentioned that it was originally in the bill as 10 years, and then that guidance has since dropped it. Um, since we've gone live here, we're now learning that the SBA just this afternoon has once again made a change, and that rate is now going up to 1%. So it's a completely fluid situation, even while we're live with you right now on the webinar. So we're trying to stay as current as possible. You can imagine that trying to prepare information um, and get that in, uh, to you in a way that is going to be helpful has been a little tricky. So keep in mind, we're still trying to present all the information we have and give you guys tools to be able to use so that you can make these decisions as this information continues to come in. And of course, your planning teams are going to be available to you for those questions as they come up. Uh, this is just our best means of getting the, the most current information out to you. Um, Jason, 
So can you please explain, uh, it looks like we've got some confusion once again on the EIDL. Um, does the EIDL and the PPP loan, are those both forgivable loans at least up to a certain point? Can you cover that once again? The EIDL loan is 100% forgivable, period, the end. I mean, it's a grant, it's not a loan. But what it indirectly does, what it, what it indirectly does is reduce the amount that's forgivable on the PPP loan. So in, in an in a indirect way, it leaves you with a $10,000 loan uh, if everything else is forgiven otherwise. And Jason, just for clarification, EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan itself, just the advanced grant portion of that would be the forgivable portion, correct? The rest of that's just a regular loan. The EIDL grant, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan grant, is a subsidiary or a provision of the SBA disaster loan. So if you apply for an SBA disaster loan, you're eligible to ask for consideration of the grant. That $10,000 grant portion, if you are awarded that, is 100% forgivable the second you get it. The problem is it makes your PPP loan less forgivable by $10,000. So it just, in, in other words, let me, let me put it this way. This is the simplest way to think about it. They're not going to give you $10,000 for free plus your PPP loan for free. They're only going to give you the grand total of the PPP loan for free. Okay. And um, one of the big questions we're getting after seeing um, your explanation and animation about kind of how we're working toward the longer you can delay taking the loan uh, probably benefits your ability for loan forgiveness, especially as we're continuing to see um, these dates get pushed out before we'll likely be able to return to a practice. Um, the biggest question is, um, can we apply now, get in line, and somehow uh, delay that origination of the loan? No bank can answer that question. I mean, it's just, it is just, um, I have, I have no clue on that. They, they, they don't even know what application they're going to use. And so um, my guess is once you're approved and they run through their, their normal process, they're going to offer you the money. And I don't know if you can just sit on that, sit on that approval for as long as you want. Ideally, that would be fantastic. I mean, anything we can do to delay without falling out of line is, would be ideal. Um, I'm hoping that there's just some organic delay in the system. So if you're in the, if you're in the apply now um, camp, I'm hoping that there's just some organic bureaucracy delay in that anyway. And it just sort of helps you out without taking your foot, you know, getting out of line and, and having to start over. Okay. And you mentioned possibly raising up a spouse's earnings during this time to potentially help with a couple of the different equations as well as, you know, moving more money uh, to, uh, to your side of the equation in that case. Um, what about for spouses that work in the practice but currently don't have any earnings? Uh, would you recommend possibly bringing him or her onto payroll? Yeah, and I don't know that bringing the spouse on at higher wages will actually help you on the equations. The reason to do it is because you could get a lot more money via loan that potentially could get forgiven than the spouse is earning on unemployment. So that's really just a play on, can you get more money out of your loan money uh, that might potentially be forgiven than you could on unemployment? So that's really the issue there. Um, if they aren't currently on payroll, um, I think that the only issue that would come up is does the bank go in and look at and see who you pulled in and start calling foul on that, um, which I, I can't imagine. I, I think this is going to be an administrative nightmare for the banks, and I can't imagine they're going to get that ticky-tack with it, uh, but I could be wrong. And Jason, a question about uh, rent and utilities. Um, if rent and utilities can be included in what the funds can be used for, why are those not used in the calculation of the loan amount in the front end? So some clarification about the two differences there. Well, I think, I think just, to avoid, just to avoid total complexity on the equation, the only guess I can have, and I'm just trying to guess at the intent there, that's why they give you the, month, the half month on the end, okay? So if this is an eight-week period, right, 
and they're going to um, include all these costs in an eight week period, but yet they're giving you two and a half times payroll, maybe that's just the easiest way to get you a little extra money to pay for some, some of those things by giving you that other, that other 0.55 times or half times on that, if you will. Um, that's the only thing I can guess on why they do that. But I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I don't understand a lot of what, what they did here and, and the reason why. I get it now, tactically, and, and I can see it, how it lays out, but I don't know why they did what they did. So if you're not solely concerned with the forgiveness of the PPP loan, but mostly would just say, this would be a great opportunity for a two-year loan at 1% interest. This would help sustain me for a while. Um, is there, are there any rules about what that money can be used for if you're not you know, specifically looking for forgiveness or is it only for designated expenses no matter what? My understanding is that when you go to present for forgiveness on the back end of this deal, the bank is going to ask for the forgivable items. They're going to ask you to prove, prove the per forgivable expenses, not where else did the money go. And, and there's some, there's some uh, ideas floating around about, well, if you use it for unauthorized expenses and this, that, and the other. To me, that really sounds like you, you did something criminal with it or you know you really used it for something completely other than the business but in my estimation i think you can use it for any business you any business cost you could we even throw around the idea if you're getting towards the end of it and you haven't used it can you you know load up on dental supplies or something i think you can use it for anything and when you go to the bank if you show up with a big bag of nothing that you haven't spent it on payroll rent utilities then they're just not going to forgive the loan at that point right um, okay, so here's an interesting scenario and just a couple more, Jason, before we move on, because we're getting a lot of questions on this particular topic. Um, let's say that you're in a startup scenario. So you definitely have major bills coming into the practice right now, but you don't have prior history employment or, or employees. And so in theory, you're not going to have anything to draw on to really calculate a PPP loan. So the first question is, is there some recourse for that? Can you still get access to the PPP loan? And then secondly, if not, well, then what would you recommend for that startup who might be struggling with those bills right now? Okay, so I had a client, uh, just to give you an example, that's not exactly fit like this, so it kind of depends on when you started, but they literally started on February the 2nd, or they bought on February the 2nd. And so they're up and running February 1. Um, we know that you have to be in business on 2.15 to qualify, and you have to be paying employees at that time. So it kind of depends on how recent your startup is. So for those people that started that bought their practice on 2-1 and they actually had payroll for the month of February, when I give them their forms to go to the bank to get the PPP loan, I'm only including February to figure out their average wages. I'm hoping that they will allow us to disregard the January to February rule on a, 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 a newer business because that would basically take one month of payroll and divide it in half and thus reduce my loan proceeds. My real average payroll can be determined based on February payroll. If you started after 215, you're not going to qualify for this loan. And so if you, it kind of depends on the time frame. If you started prior to 1-1, you should be eligible based on the wages you paid in January and February. If you started in, in February, I'm going to try and use wages that were paid in, in February to prove out uh, monthly average. If you started after 215, you can't apply for the loan. So then you're going to have to really push for an SBA disaster loan, the, the, the grant, things of that nature. That's the path you're going to have to go down, which I, I don't. I don't even know if any of my clients have even gotten a, a response other than just some acknowledgement that they have the application at this point. So unfortunately, um, I don't know that there's a ton of help. One thing that you might want to consider, I guess, is if you started up in March and happened to be an independent contractor leading up to that, then I might try to go apply as an independent contractor and, and see if I can get in the system somehow that way. I, I don't, I haven't thought through that situation enough, but that, that might be a possibility. 
Okay, Jason, and then just to wrap up this section, one question about the unemployment calculation that you showed. Um, in your example, you could, you could basically pay up to 25% before it would impact uh, the unemployment benefit with any reduction. The question is simply, can up to that 25% can or should it be paid through payroll? Yes, any, any, and I need to clear, and I need to make sure everybody understands this. If you have someone, it, and it doesn't matter if you are worried about their unemployment or not, if you have someone working and actually working for you, you have to pay them through payroll. Um, and so absolutely, if they're working, you can't, you can't um, choose to ignore, you can't be so concerned about unemployment, losing unemployment that you start to bend the rules on paying employees. And so regardless of what your goals are, if they work in your practice, they need to be paid by the hour and paid through the payroll system, period. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we've still got a lot of questions that are pertaining to the PPP loan, unemployment benefits, et cetera. So if we have time at the end of our session, we'll still circle back to some of those questions. Uh, but we do want to leave a little time uh, for Miles to go into our third topic uh, to address some of the questions that we've been getting um, that are related to the, uh, the information from the prior uh, stimulus bill, the second bill, um, that's referencing FMLA and emergency uh, paid sick leave, um, as well as some other benefits or pieces and components of the CARES Act. So Miles, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Jeff, and good evening everyone. Um, we've spent the majority of our time so far tonight, of course, discussing the PPP loan, and I think that's the appropriate place where we need to spend our time tonight. So I'm gonna move quickly through this. Um, so apologies in advance if I uh, rush through a section or I'm a little too brief. If we feel like there's additional questions on some areas here that may merit further discussion on a future webinar um, or something like that. But a, a few updates that we did wanna provide. Um, the first is we've had a chance to speak with the uh, U.S. Department of Labor, um, our local branch here in Texas, as well as um, reviewing some of the questions and answers that they have issued as sample guidance for how they intend to treat the rollout of this um, uh, Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, FFCRA. Um, so I wanted to give an update on that. I'll move quickly through this slide. As we know, if you're fewer than 500 employees, um, this bill does potentially apply to you. Um, there is an exemption for fewer than 50 employees, which is going to apply to most of you, both from the expanded FMLA requirement, as well as that scenario where, where the parent is at home with the child who has lost uh, access to childcare, school, whatever the case may be. Um, you are going to be able to elect out of that if you desire to. Um, the clarification just says that you must make documentation um, of why you believed that paid leave would jeopardize the viability of your business as a going concern. We don't have any model examples of what um, that documentation should look like. Um, they've just said you need to document it. So work with your advisor at this time to, to uh, substantiate that if you believe you are in a situation where you might need to exempt yourself. Um, my understanding at this time is if you don't have anyone who is uh, desiring to, to um, participate, especially in that extended FMLA, you may need not to not make that determination at this time. Uh, you could simply take a wait and see approach. So if your employees are furloughed, um, uh, or on reduced hours or in another situation, or if you reopen and are working full time, um, you're gonna wanna consider your specific scenario before, before making that determination. Um, when is the, the law gonna apply? It is going to go live uh, as of yesterday, April 1st. It will extend through uh, December 31st of this year. And there is going to be a period of 30 days of non-enforcement. Um, by the Department of Labor. I've seen that reported a few places as that it doesn't apply for 30 days. I don't know that that's quite correct, um, but it's simply the Department of Labor have said they will not actively pursue anyone who is found to be in, val in violation of these rules, meaning there's going to be some grace here as you are um, working through this. So a couple of questions from the FAQs and, and ones that we were able to call the DOL and talk to um, that they clarified. So if your practice is closed, but it's open for limited emergencies, are you considered open under this law? And the answer is yes. If you're open for any period of time in a, and accepting emergency patients, you are considered open, but there's more to that on the next slide, so hang with me for a second. If your practice is completely closed, meaning you are not even seeing an emergency, are you required to pay the FFCRA leave? No, you are not. 
If your practice is completely closed, there is no requirement during that time to pay the paid leave um, under this FFCRA. A couple other questions here. If your practice is open, even if limited to emergencies, but you have furloughed your employees, are those furloughed employees eligible for sick pay? Uh, no, they are not. If your practice is open but they're furloughed, um, there would not be a requirement to pay paid leave because there's no work to perform and the employee would apply for unemployment benefits instead. Um, so this is a, a situation where these rules are going to apply once your practice is reopened and or your staff is back on, on payroll and receiving work. Um, similarly, if your practice is opened and an employee is working reduced hours in the practice, is that employee eligible for paid leave? Uh, and the guidance we received there is no, they are not eligible. If they are showing up to work the hours that they have been assigned to work, even if those are reduced hours, and the rest of the time they are presumably seeking a reduced hours unemployment benefit, for the hours that they are not scheduled to work, meaning they're, I'm going to call it reduced unemployment uh, hours, they are not eligible to qualify for the sick credits for those reduced hours. And moving to our next slide, just to recap, we believe at this time for a typical MLW employee who has a uh, MLW client um, who has reduced their hours of their staff, potentially furloughed, potentially gone down this unemployment route at this time, um, based on guidance from the Department of Labor, we believe that these uh, sick leave requirements would not apply to you yet. Um, not until you reopen. However, if you are open for business, to clarify that reduced hours scenario, and an employee was scheduled to come in, let's say that you had emergencies, they were scheduled to come in on Thursday. And because of one of those qualifying categories, one through six, again, one through three, if they're directly affected by coronavirus, four through six, if they're caring for someone else affected by coronavirus, that employee, if they're unable to work their hours that they were scheduled to come in, they would potentially receive the paid leave benefit for those hours that were scheduled. So again, unscheduled hours, not eligible to receive the benefit, scheduled to come in, and they can't come in because of a scenario, they might potentially receive that benefit. And again, that does uh, allow for a dollar for dollar tax credit for wages paid under these provisions for scenarios one through three, where they're directly affected, and a two thirds uh, benefit for scenarios four through six, where they're caring for someone else who was affected. Um, however, the Treasury has yet to provide final guidelines as to exactly what that's going to look like. We've been in communication with our payroll company uh, to determine when this is going to go live. And they've said, uh, as you're probably hearing from a number of things of this government relief that's being rolled out, um, it is unclear exactly when we will get sufficient documentation from the government to be able to turn these systems on. That's what we're hearing from payroll right now. Um, so hold tight, there's a non-enforcement period. Okay, moving on, let's jump into some of the other CARES Act benefits. And like I mentioned, I'm gonna move fairly quickly here so we can cover this on a future webinar if we need to. Um, the recovery rebate advance. These are the tax credits that are uh, potentially coming in the mail. It's a little bit unclear, but hopefully uh, Secretary uh, Mnuchin said today they expect it to roll out very quickly. Um, so that is a refundable tax credit of up to $1,200 per individual, uh, $2,400 if you're married filing jointly plus $500 per child living with you that you would claim as a dependent if they're under the age of 17. Um, that is not includable in taxable income. I think I saw that in the question and answer uh, section earlier. Um, so that is not taxable income to the recipient there. It's a, it's a tax credit. Um, so that payment is going to be calculated based on your most recently filed tax return. So presumably either 2019 if you've already filed or 2018 if you have not. However, the actual credit is a 2020 tax year credit. And what that means is normally you have to wait until you file your 2020 tax return to get a 2020 tax credit. But they're going to estimate your credit and advance you that money uh, now based on your historical tax return information. So when you file your tax return, it does appear that if your tax situation in 2020 is different than it was in 2019 or 2018, depending on your last return, um, and, and many of us may have a different scenario based on uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, and the way it's affecting our economy, um, you may be able to increase your return 
at the time that you file your 2020 tax return. So if you had a killer year in 2019 and you are not eligible to receive a credit due to phase outs, we'll talk about that in a second, um, you, but you have a reduced income in 2020 below those amounts, you may still get the tax credit, but you're going to have to wait in that scenario until after you file your 2020 tax return and then it will be uh, available to you. Now, interestingly, it does not appear that there is a clawback provision uh, in that section, meaning if based on your 2019 return, uh, you qualified for a $2,400 credit and you file your 2020 and for some reason, I saw the example, you're a, a toilet paper salesman and your sales are through the roof this year um, and you would not have qualified for that credit based on your 2020 income, um, they will not make you repay that advance. Um, so there's not a situation, it appears, where you'd have to repay it, but it might increase when you file your 2020 tax return. Now, there are phase outs that begin when you're, uh, if you're married at 150,000 of income, individuals at 75,000 of income. Quickly, we'll look at the next slide. This shows a potential phase out here. Uh, let's key in for a second on the blue lines and the different shades there, which represents a married filing jointly a couple that has zero, one, two, or three kids. And the takeaway here is that that lightest blue line you can see fully faces out just a shade below $200,000. So if you make more than $200,000, you're married filing jointly and you don't have kids, um, you would not be eligible to receive a credit. Um, and you can see for each child that you, you claim, it does potentially extend that phase out. So there's a little bit of a wiggle room, some potential opportunities for some 2020 tax planning here. I think that's a conversation for August, October, December, something like that when our, our lives are hopefully, hopefully getting a little bit back to normal. All right, moving on to our next slide there. Let's talk about a couple of other provisions, one of which is the retirement account withdrawals. Now in this, they have made a provision called a special coronavirus related distribution uh, from these retirement accounts that allows you to take up to $100,000 from a qualified account. Most commonly, this is gonna be an IRA or a 401k. Now the money must be withdrawn in calendar year 2020, so you have to do it this year, and you must be able to show an IRS approved economic hardship, and they've promised to provide some documentation on this. But it appears that being furloughed, um, quarantined, uh, loss of childcare and you had to stay home, all would be scenarios. It appears they're gonna be pretty open-handed on what would potentially qualify as an economic hardship. Um, so if you take that money out, let's use IRA for a second as an example. If you pull $100,000 out of your IRA because you've got uh, maybe a large balance built up there, you would not be subject to that 10% penalty that you would normally be charged if you took money out of your IRA prior to age 59 and a half. Um, but it's important to understand ordinary income tax would still apply. So this, if this is a pre-tax or traditional IRA and you take money out, you would still owe the income tax on that withdrawal. It's just the 10% penalty that is waived. If you're listening tonight and you're age 60 or older, there's really not much of a change for you because you wouldn't have had the 10% penalty anyway. Um, now, if you are paying that, that, income, that income tax calculated on your withdrawal, you do have the option to spread that out over three years if you would like to. So presumably you could pay a third of that balance, that income taxes balance due in 2020, a third in 2021, and again in 2022 to finish that off. And if you return the money back to the account you took it out of, let's say back to your IRA, before that three-year window ex expires, there's a potential to reduce or eliminate the income tax liability. So potential to take the money out, use it now, life goes back to normal, hopefully you, you're making money again, you replace that income uh, or that money in the IRA, you could reduce your income tax liability potentially there. A related concept is the expansion of 401k loans. Historically, those have been uh, capped at $50,000. That has been doubled to up to $100,000. Um, but of course, that is limited to 100% of the amount of the employee's vested balance. So if you have a vested balance of $20,000, um, naturally the amount you can take out is $20,000, not up to $100,000 if you don't have the money. Um, additional guidelines are forthcoming, but for many of you, a lot of small business 401k plans do not allow for loans um, in their plan documents because it can be a little bit more expensive. It can be administratively complex to, to administer. Um, there is apparently going to be guidance on how you may choose to amend your plan if you would like to. 
uh, to be able to offer loans to yourself or your employees at this time. That may be a complex process. We may have to wait on guidelines there. So I just wanna help people tonight understand this is not necessarily a benefit that's going to be available tomorrow or next week. Uh, you're, if you don't currently offer 401k loans, you're gonna have to work with your TPA. Certainly will help to guide our MLW clients uh, to be able to offer those provisions. Uh, and then briefly covering if you had payments that were calculated, so a loan you would repay to the 401k based on an amortization schedule, any payments due um, between basically, let's say April and the end of the year, you have the option to waive at this time and wait up to a year uh, or delay those payments up to a year. Um, both the loans and early withdrawals, let's talk about this for a second, are uh, subject to, to liquidation of investments, whether it's in your IRA or your 401k, which would potentially mean you're locking in your losses today and losing out on investment return. Now, I get it. We've got a hierarchy of needs here. And if we're struggling to put food on the table, we've got to access funds no matter what. And we want to have sympathy for people that are in that situation. Um, but I've just seen a sentiment as if this is somehow like $100,000 we can just take as a loan and, and it doesn't affect our investments. Um, but you do have to liquidate those holdings to raise the cash to get the money out. Um, and so if the market rebounds, you would not be able to participate in the rebound of the stock market until you have finished repaying that loan or replaced the money. Again, for some people that may still make sense, just take it into consideration. Student loan relief. Uh, now this applies only to federal student loans. It is not legally mandated for relief for any private student loan servicers. So if you've refinanced with a SoFi, a Laurel Road, something like that, you're not automatically eligible for a benefit. Uh, we understand they may be working with taxpayers or with individuals who have loans to help them, but it's a separate program. Um, so for any federal student loan, the required student loan payments are suspended until September 30th, 2020, with no accrual of interest during that time. However, it appears that uh, by default, the payments will continue, especially if you were paying ahead or had paid extra or something like that on those student loans. So you may wish to call your federal student loan servicer to make sure they are suspending that loan if you wish to do so at this time. That period of time from now until September 30th will count towards any loan forgiveness programs. So if we've got a few people here tonight who are maybe uh, in a, in a uh, underserved clinic or something like that participating in the public service loan forgiveness fund, you guys are definitely gonna wanna suspend payments because you'll get credit towards that forgiveness um, while also not being required to make a payment. So it's a potential benefit for you uh, if you're in one of those qualified programs. Um, and any garnishment related to student debt is also suspended. So if you've gotten behind on payments and had your paycheck garnished or something, that's also waived at this time. Now the employee retention credit is a, a question we've got, gotten recently. Um, and let me first mention that as of this time, it appears that employers who receive a PPP loan are ineligible to receive the credit. So it's an either or situation, not a both and. Um, but let's walk through it just in case, you know, we have people in a situation that they might qualify. In order to qualify, a business must be fully or partially suspended during a calendar quarter of the year as a result of a governmental authority. Uh, I think for the majority of our listeners tonight, that box is, is pretty well checked. Um, or if you've seen a year over year reduction in revenues of at least 50% when compared to the same quarter of the previous year, again, with many of you closed down, you may very likely qualify for that uh, as well in, in Q2 of 2020. So once qualified, the business remains eligible for the remainder of 2020 until the suspension is lifted and or your revenues return to excess of 80% of the previous year's quarter. We won't get into much more technical detail on that tonight, um, but for businesses under 100 employees, which I think is what we're dealing with here, the credit is equal to 50% of the wages paid in any calendar quarter, capped at $10,000 of wages per employee for a total of a $5,000 credit. So it's an alternative calculation. Um, based on where we're at at this time, we do still feel that the PPP loan program is going to be more valuable because it's potentially in, in excess of this. And it does, as Jason covered, have some interplay with unemployment, whereas this one would not necessarily interplay with that because you'd need to have them on your payroll and be paying out of your pocket um, to qualify for this. But it's something that could potentially be on the table even down the road. 
And moving to our, I believe, last slide tonight, let's talk about that deferral of payroll taxes. Again, in the bill right now, it says that this does not apply to any business who has debt forgiven by the CARES Act. So presumably that also applies to these PPP loan recipients. So this is, is in a separate category. Um, but if you are eligible for this, um, you may defer your employer portion, not the employee portion that came out of their paychecks. That still has to be paid in. But the company portion, um, you may defer that payment through December 31st, 2020. So any accruals of payroll between now and the end of the year. And 50% of that balance, uh, deferred balance is due by December 31st, 2021. And the remaining 50% is due by the end of 2022. Uh, now let's reflect on that a second. This is not any kind of forgiveness. It's simply a deferment. Um, so again, thinking about the interplay between the employee retention credit and these deferral payroll taxes versus the PPP, um, this payroll tax provision is not forgiving any amount. It's simply deferring the timing of that payment, but you must still pay all of these taxes in full um, by the end of 2022. We've been in discussions with Intuit, who is our main payroll provider, and they are in communication with the IRS, um, but you're gonna hear a familiar refrain from all of us tonight that they do not yet know when these provisions will go live. They have not received uh, communications from the IRS or from the government as to how this will roll out. They have not received a draft form of the revised 941 that presumably this will go on to. There's just a lot of missing pieces to this information right now. So we're getting questions. If you just ran your payroll this week, do you have to pay those payroll taxes? Our best guidance is yes. To our knowledge, this has not gone live. This has not been, um, been brought uh, on board yet by these programs. There's not a, a path where you could register this through the payroll system. So our best understanding is that you do need to go ahead and pay those for these, this pay period. Again, if you're taking the PPP loan, you're going to need to continue to pay those anyway. Um, and so there's going to be some, some interplay between those two. But we will keep you apprised as we see that go live. Thanks, Miles. Uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, is there something that uh, clients need to do to apply for the exemption of the family sick leave? So again, they've not really clarified what you need to do. There's not an official form you need to fill out. Um, there's not a government department that you need to notify at this time. They simply have stated that you need to document um, clear evidence as to why you believe uh, offering this extended sick leave, this extended uh, FMLA, would be a, a, a hazard to the economic interest, the going concern status of your business. Um, so we don't know exactly what that looks like. We, we presume that uh, there will be future um, model language that comes out that may document some of this. Um, so best bet right now, um, document it well, take uh, contemporaneous notes of the situation, and we believe that should be uh, sufficient. And remember, for the first 30 days, they are, there is a period of non-enforcement, and they've also offered to indemnify employers from any uh, civil lawsuits that arise from non-compliance. So you do have a 30-day period of grace here as we all learn about this along the way. And if they're going to use any of the emergency uh, sick pay um, component of what you were just describing, uh, how would you execute that in the payroll system? I guess this, this case specifically our clients, um, do you want to put that under, you know, sick pay or sick time or vacation time or another column or how would you advise doing that? Yeah, so this is uh, really a fascinating question that hopefully the IRS is going to be rolling out soon. So our clients who are on our standard payroll just ran their paycheck um, for, for tomorrow, hours were due by yesterday, as you guys well know. And none of the, the days that were included on that were post April 1st days for that pay period. So none of those days were gonna be eligible anyway, which means the first pay period that you could potentially have someone eligible for this. And again, we think going back to what I said about furloughed employees and, and anybody on unemployment not qualifying, especially if your business is shut down or working reduced hours, um, there may not be very many people that need to input those hours, but presumably sometime between today where we stand with no guidance and April 17th when that payroll goes through or April 15th when you're processing the payroll, uh, we're hoping for guidance from the IRS, a revised form 941 that will show us how to claim this, 
um, a, a new slot in the payroll software that has a separate uh, tracking mechanism for qualified sick leave that would be separate and apart from uh, the company paid time off that's offered. So we're expecting a lot of things to come online. Um, boy, I sure hope it's by this next pay period or it's gonna get a little bit tricky to calculate, um, but the government's missing a lot of deadlines right now. So it, it's hard to speculate on exactly when that's gonna happen. Okay, thanks, Miles. Uh, we've still got a lot of your questions, so we're going to just do a quick kind of rapid fire round with all three of our panelists and try to hit as many of these as we can um, as we wrap up this evening. Uh, Michael, I'm going to go back to you first in reference to the PPP application. Um, Part-time employees, should those be included or temporary employees as you're either calculating the gross wage expense or the number you're putting in for number of jobs? Uh, I would think that they would be included in the wage expense. We honestly do not have guidance on whether or not they would fall into that job category or not. Um, but I would think the wages would be included, not sure on the job yet. And do we know yet if the application itself is going to be filed by paper or online? I think it's going to depend on the bank. Um, I, I, some of the larger banks uh, we've heard of, uh, like I think Chase and Bank of America, we've gotten Preliminary word that those may be online uh, through their portals. Um, smaller banks are probably still going to be by paper. So it, it's probably going to depend on where you're applying. Okay. Uh, Jason, if we deferred um, our loans for 90 days because that was the recommendation for cash flow purposes, should we start paying those uh, once they you know, start coming back in again, um, once we get the PPP money? For example, maybe just paying the interest or you know, even if they're during the deferment period. I, I would probably in this scenario, keep my cash, keep the deferments live, whether it's rent or loan, take advantage of that cash is king. We don't know how long this is going to last and try and preserve those, uh, those loan proceeds. Because really at the end of the day, what drives forgiveness is going to be payroll, um, and not necessarily uh, related to the money we spent on rent, even though we can, um, I would limit it. I would limit my payments to rent that I have to pay and loan payments that I have to pay. And I would try and defer everything else. Jason, can you put your staff back on unemployment after the, the uh, PPP period, if you're still not seeing patients? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. That is a risk here because theoretically, if your eight week coverage period starts and you still have not open by that time, um, but keep in mind, I don't know that we've necessarily during the eight week period pulled back some of our lower waged employees yet anyway. So the only reason that would be a problem is if you did pull those people back and ran out of money. Um, I guess your hygienist and things like that. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't, I haven't thought through the foresight of that, but my guess is you could, I mean, if you can't pay them due to Corona, and you're in a shelter in place, then I, I presume you could put them back on unemployment. Okay. Michael, can we pay certain employees a higher wage during the eight week period, or does it have to be similar to their historic levels? Assuming that you're probably trying to get your equation numbers up. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I would think that it would depend on what they're doing. Uh, obviously from an IRS standpoint, you would have to meet reasonable comp standards as far as why you're paying them what you're paying them. I would think there's some flexibility there um, as long as it's within reason based on you know what they're doing for you. Okay. Uh, Miles, if I sign up and grab as much as I can with the EIDL loan, assuming that that's at a higher interest rate, of course, than the, uh, than the PPP loan, but possibly lower than some other loans you might have had previously, are there restrictions on what that uh, goes, that can be applied toward, or can you use it to pay down other higher interest debts? So most of the SBA loans have provisions that you cannot refinance uh, existing debt simply to take advantage of a governmental subsidized program for the, with the concept of reducing your interest rate on a private loan. Um, so expressly, can you do that? No, that, that is forbidden in the, the concepts. Um, now, are they going to be tracking this on a dollar for dollar conceptual basis? I, I don't know. And so if you're using... Uh, some of your pot of money to repay uh, rent and staff and things like that, and you also are at some point able to refinance, I think you need to be careful to, to, to denote and track the funds that are used for each. Um, but I don't think you're necessarily blocked from refinancing your loan 
period. Um, but I do think you need to be careful about using directly SBA funds to pay off or refinance another loan. Okay, thanks, Miles. Jason, you mentioned that you always need to make sure you're paying your employees if they are providing work for you. Um, what if you are going in as a doctor to see emergencies, do you also have to make sure that you pay yourself in that same situation? I don't think so. Um, because in that situation, are you really earning a prop? Where's the profit coming from to pay yourself the salary? Really, you're going in because you have to. Um, and, and anything you earn from that patient is just a scratch in the surface on your overhead. So the stance I'm taking on that is you're earn you don't have any money to pay yourself salary. So no, I, I don't think you have to turn around and pay yourself a salary like you would the staff. The staff, you're actually, you're obligated to pay them uh, under labor law. And so for you, it's, there's no money to pay you. So that's the stance I would take on that. Okay. And um, must all forgivable expenses, Jason, occur by June 30th, even if your eight week period, uh, the origination doesn't start, you know, um, 60 days prior to that. So maybe a better way to put that is if you, if your eight weeks would take you beyond the June 30th timeframe, do you know if you still have to be done by June 30th or do you get the full eight weeks? My understanding is that you can take this eight week loan anytime prior to 630. The 630 date is when the loans stop, when they're not being offered. That's the important significance of that loan is that that's the date you can no longer get a loan. And secondly, that's the date you have to rehire everybody in order to get the grace period on the full-time equivalents and the salary. So um, my guess is that eight week period can extend beyond that 630 because they're still giving those loans up until 630. Okay, Michael, are federal taxes included in the average monthly payroll calculation? Employer taxes, no. Uh, for, uh, I mean, so the employer portion of Social Security and Medicare, the answer is no. Uh, any federal taxes withheld from employees pay uh, I mean, that would be deducted from their pay. So their, their gross compensation is, is what should uh, be included in that number, is, is their gross compensation before those federal taxes are, are taken out. Okay. And Michael, another question about forgiveness in this situation. If um, a doctor or a doctor and spouse doesn't pay, uh, pay themselves on this last pay period, um, is that payment due applicable to the forgiven amount once we get the loan? So in other words... I think what they're asking is, can you go and sort of retro pay, put it inside the period of the, uh, of the eight weeks and count that toward forgiveness? That's a great question. Uh, I mean, it was our understanding that that wasn't in the eight week time period. Uh, I actually received an email from a, a bank while we've been on this call that they're thinking that, you know, that period may, back, may go back and capture, you know, prior to that. Uh, but, but we're thinking the eight week period starts once the, the loan actually originates. Good, thanks. Miles, um, last question for you. Um, why would you take out a loan from the 401k plan under these revised rules, as opposed to uh, just taking a distribution with a plan to repay it? You know, it's a good question. I think it depends on the situation. For example, if, if your funds are in an IRA, an IRA is not eligible to make a loan. Um, if you have a 401k program that doesn't currently offer loans, um, you may be subject to um, having to, you know, amend the plan documents and add it in and other delays on that process. So sometimes a distribution may be the most uh, expedient route. Um, but, but yes, I mean, I think 401k loans generally, if, if you have to do one or the other, they can be a great option, especially since the monthly payments are, um, are deferred up to a year uh, for the 2020 payments. Um, they do calculate a, a, a monthly repayment amount. They are not includable in income. So there is a lot to like about the 401k program uh, if, if you're needing to do a loan there. Um, basically, they've brought the disbursements on to be another option that is similar uh, to the loan and available for accounts that cannot do a loan. Miles, do you think that the fact that you can add interest to the loan going back to the account to benefit yourself would also possibly put you on the, you know, leaning toward the side of the loan? You know, it certainly depends. Um, there's a wide range of opinions out there on the true economic benefits of 401k 
uh, loans and the interest paid, you know, I hear if you're going to pay interest, you're paying it to yourself. Yes, but it also means it's, it's uh, you know, a dollar in your left pocket moving to your right pocket isn't necessarily creating a new dollar. Um, so is there a little bit of a tailwind there that, that reduces drag? Maybe. I don't think it's life changing, though. All right. Thanks, Miles. Uh, folks, as we wrap up this evening, uh, we do want to remind you that uh, we will continue to gather and review information as it's becoming available and provide updates as soon as possible. Also, our MLW clients are encouraged to send your planning team update emails when you can. A brief synopsis of what you've completed and, and what you're working on as it pertains to these loans, unemployment, other practice concerns can be a huge help to both you and your planning team. So, you know, consider that as an option as a great communication resource. Uh, the recording of this webinar is going to be available once it's processed and available for upload. Uh, you can find that on our website or via social media. Also, follow us on Facebook or Twitter for notifications of updates during the COVID-19 crisis. I want to say thanks to our panelists, Jason, Michael, and Miles, and to everyone at our team who helped with uh, research and preparation for this evening's webinar. Now, keep in mind, the requirements for these PPP applications are still in flux, and we are hearing from more banks that they will likely not be ready for applications tomorrow. Uh, but as mentioned earlier, be on the lookout for your summary sheet and supporting documentation for the, for the application to be uploaded to your client portal at some time soon. Our team is here for you and we're in this together. Thanks again and good night.